In this technological age, television is the stage on which a magician often plays to his audience. Mastery of this medium is yet one more skill in his ever-changing repertoire. Magicians are, after all, the only people allowed to legitimately deceive us. To do it, they have to be masters of many arts. Exploiting the public's confusion of constantly changing technology and applying it to the secret world of illusion has been a tool used for centuries. The magic touch, yeah. It is the magician's ultimate goal to make the impossible seem possible. Throughout the history of magic, scientific principles have been exploited to entertain and mystify the audiences. Static electricity made safe enough to thrill, but not to kill. The destructive force of fire tamed by performers who acquired the secret knowledge of fireproofing themselves. Incense, flash powder, and dry ice, even strange gases and narcotics have, over the years, permeated theaters, employed by illusionists eager to create a magical atmosphere. Some of the greatest illusions ever seen in magic were constructed with a watchmaker's precision in a time long before plastics, carbon fiber, and computer-aided design. In most people's minds, conjurers are primarily entertainers. But as illusion makers, magicians have always been on the cutting edge of technology. Yesterday's magic is the science of today, much the way alchemy became chemistry into modern science. And the magic of today, perhaps, could be the science of tomorrow. Magicians have always tried to utilize new advances in scientific knowledge in their performances. This included, of course, everything from early use of electricity, electromagnetism, radio, and other microelectronics today. The technology that early magicians used was known only to a few academics and scientists, and virtually unknown to the general public. Magicians skillfully adapted the technology, so its use wasn't perceivable, even to experts. The public's need to be mystified and even terrified has always inspired magic. And magicians have often used knowledge of optics to create a vicarious thrill. Some of the most effective illusions still prove that old saying, it's done with smoke and mirrors. Knowledge of optical principles has been of tremendous value to magicians and this really began in the late 18th century. The use of the magic lantern in a covert way. Invented a century earlier, the magic lantern was a forerunner of the modern slide projector. Powered by a flickery smoking oil lamp and projecting hand-painted glass slides that provided harmless parlor entertainment. Harmless until a magician invented a magic show called Phantasmagoria. Now the Phantasmagoria show, which was really a fantastic multimedia ghost show, that was first introduced into Europe in the early 1790s. It was presented in Vienna and Berlin and then eventually manifested itself in Paris at the time of the French Revolution. It was presented by a man called Etienne Gaspard Robert, a Belgian, or Robertson as he became known. And Robertson was a sort of Steven Spielberg of the Phantasmagoria show, if you like. He created a fantastic show which took place at the Convent des Capuchines in the center of, of Paris. And he devised all kinds of wonderful devices The method that Robertson used in order to produce his ghosts was the magic lantern applied to back projection. Hidden from public view, Robertson would project multi-layered lantern slides that showed well-known figures of the day, ghosts, 
fairy tales and fables. Some slides gave the appearance of movement, fading, dissolving, rotating. These were then projected either onto the smoke from the brazier or onto a muslin screen to great effect. In mid-18th century Europe, there was a wave of public interest in all things occult, especially witchcraft, secret societies, and seances. A failed German cafe owner saw a way to combine his knowledge of magic with some of the earliest special effects on record and, at the same time, entertain and terrify the public. Johann Tropfer began holding seances in his billiard room in Leipzig. He quickly learned how to deceive his customers into thinking that he had the power to conjure up the spirits of their dead ancestors. Borrowing techniques used by ancient priests to make their followers more susceptible, Tropfer first insisted that the participants fast for 24 hours before the seance. He then further confused their weakened senses with narcotic drinks and incense. Dramatic and frequent lighting changes would cause their pupils to constantly dilate so that normal vision became impossible. Temperature changes and loud sound effects intensified the already charged atmosphere. Schroepfer used occult language, hieroglyphics, and incantations to weave his spell on these befuddled participants. All of the elements were a sophisticated form of misdirection distracting the audience from his real methods. Hidden in the darkness was a magic lantern, ready to project a likeness of the dead ancestor. And as they stood in the magic circle, they felt a tingling sensation in the soles of their feet. This was very much of a multi-sensory experience, one experience overlapping on top of another. It was optical, oral, tactile, and very, very strange indeed. And as they stood and listened, they could fancy they heard strange voices, a huge crashing, thunder and lightning sounds. And finally, all of the lights would be extinguished. There they would be in pitch darkness, the only light coming from a brazier in the corner of the room. A column of incense rose from that brazier, and there in the center, they would see an apparition departed. Sometimes they would be so terrified, they would just scream and run from the room. Tropfer was using all manner of props such as uh, narcotics, even electric shocks. That was the tingling sensation they felt through the soles of their feet. In fact, it was quite a psychological experience in a way, a mixture of sensory deprivation, auto-suggestion and the actual mumbo-jumbo of the whole thing. This TLC program is sponsored. At the window, your reflection appears to be at a distance beyond the glass, equal to the distance between you and the window. A spectacular use of this simple optical principle amazed Parisians in the 1890s at the Cabaret de Neon, or the Tavern of the Dead. Invited into the Hall of Spectres by the robed and hooded proprietor, visitors would be offered a drink of strychnine, cholera, or pestilence, really beer, vermouth, or absinthe. Having consumed their poison, the guests were led down the subterranean passages to the Room of Disintegration. Welcome, weary wanderer, to the realm of death. You have at last arrived at the place where you are to leave your souls behind. Confronted by a beautiful girl, they watched in horror as she slowly transformed into a skeleton. What the mystified visitors did not see was the hidden sheet of plate glass and full-size skeleton set at an angle to the girl. Nor did they notice the lighting change as the hidden spotlight was shown onto the skeletal figure. Pepper's ghost eventually fell into disuse, though in magic, many modern illusions still rely on the same principle. One of the most spectacular applications of Professor Pepper's illusion is the haunted ballroom at Disneyland. When I was visioning what the future of magic would be or bring, 
It was about light, manipulating intangible light. So I started playing with different lights, conjuring lights as if an ancient shaman or a shaman in the future would conjure fire and transform it into light. It was kind of an evolution piece, going from the ancient tribal magic fires way into the distant future. Appearing to defy gravity is the basis of many magical illusions, perhaps none more famous than the legendary Indian rope trick. The basis of the Indian rope trick was that the fakir would throw the rope up in the air, the little boy would climb the rope, he'd vanish at the top, the rope would fall to the ground, the little boy would be gone. That was the basis of the whole thing. But the rope trick may have its roots in another part of the mysterious East. One of the best descriptions of the Indian rope trick is that of Ibn uh, Butanta in the 14th century. He saw it apparently in China, but I don't think we can claim that he was a very good witness because he admits in this account that whenever he saw magic performed, he felt faint. And uh, therefore, I think we can say that the description, like so many of the others, is clothed in fiction. The reason this particular trick has always been thought of as Indian may come from a later but no less far-fetched account dating from the early 17th century. It was the age of the famous court magicians of the great Mughal Emperor Jahangir. The idea of ascending to heaven is a common theme in many religions. There is this notion of the rope that goes from this plane of existence to a higher plane. So ascension, moving up into the higher level, the higher plane of existence. Uh, I suspect that that's what the illusion is all about, and that's why it's been around so long. Magicians have long exploited the rope trick in their publicity material, but so far, there are no reliable witnesses who can honestly claim that they have ever seen the trick performed. It's always been my nanny's cousin's aunt had a cousin who had a brother who, somewhere along the line, uh, was in the Indian Army and saw the Indian rope trick. You can never ever get a guy who said, I saw the Indian rope trick. One authentic version of the trick can be successfully performed, but only if it's outdoors, at night, surrounded by trees, and lit only by a flickering firelight. The performance relies heavily on darkness, the boy's acrobatic agility, and the magician's skills of persuasion. Through the power of suggestions, you can make people see things, feel things, experience things that aren't actually happening. A good magician that is very good with uh, neuro-linguistic programming or hypnotic induction can create the experience that an elephant vanishes on stage by suggesting it, by creating mental pictures that are triggered by words and sound. As the boy scrambled up the rope, the magician threw incense or even hashish into the fire, creating clouds of hypnotic smoke. Hidden by these swirling clouds, the boy quickly walked to safety along a hidden tightrope and then hid inside the magician's basket. Magic happens, I think inside people's minds. And so spellbinding an audience really is involving them in a mental image or series of images that become more and more real and important and powerful for them. 
Onlookers were certain they'd seen the boy climb the rope and disappear. So when the magician produced him from the basket, they believed they had witnessed the impossible. Highly exaggerated reports no doubt helped create the mythology that now surrounds the Indian rope trick. Based on the research of those who have seriously studied the history and tradition of the Indian rope trick, I'm convinced that it is overwhelmingly a combination of legend and folklore, perhaps derived from performances by fakirs and street magicians in India doing much less ambitious feats of magic and talking about legends of an Indian rope trick, but the feat itself to my knowledge, has certainly only been performed by conventional uh, illusion methods on stage by performers during the 20th century. said from all the audience records that we have that trick on stage has not made much of an impression upon the audience but as we will see similar illusions based on levitation and suspension were often copied and refined by western magicians this is my invention <laughs> by deliberately confusing their senses and baffling them with science was a specialty of the man called the father of modern magic Jean-Eugène Robert Houdin. In 1845, his parties were the talk of Parisian society. But the finest magician of his day wasn't above combining real scientific principles with bogus pseudoscience. One of his greatest illusions was the aerial suspension, in which Houdin made someone appear to defy the laws of gravity. Robert Houdin began by explaining that the new anesthetic wonder ether had an undiscovered property. It could make a person lighter than air. As he talked, a hidden assistant wafted the drug into the audience. The magician would apparently drug his son with a bottle of ether, in actual fact just water. Supported only by a rod under each arm, the boy fell into a slumber. The magician then began removing the only apparent means of support. He next lifted his son's legs so that the boy was horizontal, and then finally took away one of the supporting platforms. The boy now appeared impossibly suspended and defying gravity. The show always ended with this illusion, and the curtain always fell to rapturous applause. Robert Houdin had discovered that by presenting science in a magical context with a believable plot and a powerful stage performance, even a sophisticated audience could be made to believe almost anything. Illusion designers who followed have kept his legacy alive to present day. The futuristic robots of the modern stage show are the successors of the antique machines. No less sophisticated and just as baffling to the audiences they were presented to over a century ago.
Of course, the workings of stage illusions are still closely guarded secrets. Back in 1849, Robert Houdin's masterpiece of mechanical magic was a puppet, barely 34 inches tall, called Antonio Diavolo. The simple-looking doll mystified all of Europe, and its secret has been kept for almost 150 years. Performing to a small audience on a specially built stage, Antonio the trapeze artist would nod and bow to the crowd before beginning his routine of lifelike acrobatics. Antonio was, in fact, a carefully weighted, articulated machine. Complex movements were caused by the motion of tiny pistons and levers. We can only guess how he acquired the momentum to rotate vertically and let go with his hands without any contact with the onstage magician at any time during his performance. The method and materials of his construction may be known, but the secret of his movement remains a magical mystery. Lifelike machines had been a very popular part of magical entertainment since the 18th century. Popular because they often appeared to interact with the public. One of the most famous uh, automata, or pseudo-automata, is the chess-playing automaton of Ulfgan von Kempelen. Modeled on a Turkish figure and built in 1770 for an Austrian empress, this life-size automaton traveled Europe playing chess and defeating commoners and kings alike. After a century-long career, he has recently been restored to full working order. Von Kimplin would, uh, would push out the chess player, the machine itself, and pull out a set of keys. He would then open the left-hand door, exposing all of the machinery and take a lit candle around to the back and open the door there to show that there's nothing but machinery in there. Now, again, leaving all of the doors flapping in the breeze, he would roll the whole machine around and show that the Turk had uh, a couple of small doors inside his back and in his legs and lifting up his robe, again, just expose the machinery. Then, turn it all back around and lock it up, and he's ready for the performance. With lifelike movements, unerring judgment, and his expressionless face, the chess player proved to be an intimidating opponent. After alleged victories over Napoleon, Benjamin Franklin, and Catherine the Great of Russia, author Edgar Allan Poe apparently became obsessed with uncovering the secret. Theories range from off-stage assistance with remote control devices to electromagnets. But the most popular speculation involved a hidden chess expert, despite the fact that the cabinet appeared only large enough to contain the clockwork mechanism. One of the biggest fictions that has arisen around it was actually perpetrated by no less than Robert Houdin. In his memoirs, he claimed that this automaton was made uh, in order to conceal a legless Polish warrior. This unfortunate man called Wierowski had had his leg shattered with a cannon, and that was the modus operandi. The automatonic chess player even exhibits a chess master's temperament. Growing impatient if an opponent takes too long to make a move, if an opponent dares make an illegal move thinking the automaton wouldn't notice, the chess player takes dramatic action. Even today, the idea of an automaton can entertain us. We have done a major breakthrough in magic technology. We have built a perfect audio animatronic figure of Teller. Now the real Teller is operating the figure from right over there. Now, even when you know how this trick is done, it's still pretty powerful. Look at this. It looks like Teller, but it's not. It's a different kind of dummy. And any trick is possible. Watch this. Just, just want to rip out his hair? I just... <laughs> Rip out his hair. No palming, no special effects. I just pull it out and then someone will put it in again backstage. With this dummy, everything is 
easy. No special effect on this. If I want to hit him, I just hit him. Nice flinch, Teller. Nice flinch. <laughs> now, the next model will walk around, but balance is still a pretty big problem right now, so all the tricks we're doing right away have to be done lying down. But uh, watch this. We build it in. Go ahead, Teller. Hit it. Hi, folks. How are you enjoying the show? <laughs> it doesn't sound very good, but we're not going to use it much anyway. Okay, uh, here's just a simple trick you haven't seen before. This is a pretty nice one. Uh, Teller, do the, do, the, do the tongue thing. <laughs> There we go. Uh, 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 uh. Now, if you didn't know that was a dummy, you'd be really screaming right now, wouldn't you? Tell her, do I, uh, do I save this, tell her? Magicians have always been fascinated by the so-called allied arts, acts that date back from a time when magicians performed at village fairs along with daredevil circus performers. Some of the more obscure artists and their strange acts have long since disappeared, usually for obvious reasons, including the mouse eater, the flaming sword swallower, the stone eater whose stomach contents rumble loudly, and the young lady whose specialty was swallowing giant razor blades. In the 17th century, one popular specialty act was the spouter, who could regurgitate water, beer, or wine on demand. Senor Haji Ali. Haji Ali was a truly remarkable performer who was of Egyptian origin and became rather well known during the 1920s, 1930s. He was a regurgitationist. And his act, which I dare say few people tried to fully emulate, consisted of him swallowing incredibly large quantities of water. And by a remarkable degree of control over his abdominal muscles, he was able to spout the water he had ingested a considerable distance across a room. <laughs> but the most devastating thing he did which probably contributed to his uh, illness, the illness that caused his death, was that he would swallow a, a large quantity of water Salute, senora, senora. and then drink a bottle of kerosene. The kerosene would float in his stomach on top of the water. He would first regurgitate the kerosene onto what looked like a small burning pyre and of course by spouting the kerosene the entire uh, surface of this object would go up in flames <laughs> After he had exhausted the kerosene, he still had this large quantity of water in his stomach, and he would spout the water to extinguish the flames he had produced. Haji Ali's early death due to heart failure and bronchitis underlines the dangers associated with some of these allied arts. But perhaps none is more dangerous than handling and breathing real fire. People think of fire as a part of the great mystery. It has properties that can destroy us and certainly can terrify us. This is the workshop of radicals. A one-car garage where two young men with $500... I think fire is a good symbol for the mystery, for the magic, for the unknown. And it's only that we project on the fire properties that give it more power than perhaps it really has. And historically, I don't think we can find a time when, when people were, were not in awe of fire. 
The relationship of magicians with the mythical salamander can be traced back to the ancient legend of a fabled beast impervious to fire. Performers in recent centuries adopted the name salamander to encompass fire breathing, fire handling, and other feats of flammable bravado. One of the greatest exponents of the trade was Signora Girardelli. Billed as the fireproof female, she amazed English audiences in the early 19th century with her apparent incombustibility. The secret of her act was probably a knowledge of methods of physically hardening the skin, techniques which have been known for thousands of years. There are quite a few ways of um, fireproofing yourself. Uh, the one I've found, which uh, is also used in circus a lot, uh, such as trapeze, to harden your hands, is um, surgical spirit. Um, probably the oldest technique would be um, urinating on them, because that is the best way to toughen up hands, feet, skin in general. Um, but it still won't get you used to the heat, so although your hands will be more resistant, more like elbow skin, um, it will still heat up. Um, there's not much you can do about that other than either hiding it um, on your face or uh, moving it out of the fire. <laughs> Some old recipes involve mixing substances that numb the skin to protect you from feeling pain, while others protect you from actually getting burned. In modern chemical terms, the goal is to increase the heat capacity of the hand. Uh, that means that you increase the hand or the body's capacity to absorb heat without getting burned. You can think about it this way. If you, uh, if you set your, your home oven to 100 Fahrenheit, you can put your hand in that oven very easily without getting burned. You won't be harmed at all. It'll be pleasantly warm, in fact. But if you plunge your hand into boiling water, then you'll get scalded and you'll get blisters. What's the difference? Well, the heat capacity of water is huge in comparison to the heat capacity of air. The way to prevent getting damaged as opposed to feeling the pain is to put something between you and the heat in order to absorb that heat. You don't become physically resistant to pain. I find that if you've been doing it every day for a week, you'll probably find yourself with a higher resistance to if you do it seven times in one day. If you did it seven times in one day, you'd probably end up with blisters. Um, so it's a little over a long period of time, and so then you would definitely build up a resistance. One of her more startling exploits was to handle molten lead, though almost certainly it was an amalgam of other metals. With a melting point of 158 degrees Fahrenheit, that's more than hot enough to severely burn a careless performer. When you're pouring molten metal across your skin, for example, the danger is not the actual temperature of the metal. Uh, you can handle very hot things as long as you keep them moving. Because as long as the metal is molten, it's simply maintaining that temperature and it's not delivering an inordinate amount of heat to your hand. It's only when the metal solidifies uh, if you think about it, it takes heat to ma make a metal from solid to liquid and to go the opposite direction delivers that same amount of heat. So when the metal freezes, solidifies, it dumps all of that, we call it in chemistry, the latent heat of fusion into your hand. And that's what hurts. Fire walking, as a ritual or as a magic trick, is universal and ancient. One of the most famous performers was Indian magician Kuda Bucks, who, in his series of highly publicized firewalks in the 1930s, subjected himself to scientific scrutiny in order to prove that there was no trick to his incombustibility. He passed all the tests and took his secret, if he had one, to the grave. The descendants is Kulla Naro Kuni Bagdam Salaman Allah Ibrahim. Over the years, many people have attempted to unlock firewalking's dangerous secret. Scientists have searched for centuries to find a theory that can explain the phenomenon.
First of all, I want to caution anybody who's watching the show not to simply build a fire in your backyard and attempt to walk across it. I've walked across the fire thousands of times, and in the early days, I got burned quite a number of times. I learned from my mistakes. I've seen people horrifically burned walking through wood embers, wood coals. I've seen people receive third-degree burns, which means that all the layers of flesh have been charred completely burned. At temperatures well above 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, as hot as napalm, the mystery of how fire walkers escape serious injury is not easily explained. One theory, the Leidenfrost effect, shows how a water droplet can skip across a hot metal plate, supported by a layer of its own vapor as it evaporates. Water vapor is a poor heat conductor, creating an insulating barrier between the droplet and the hot plate. But this doesn't explain how firewalking can be performed safely in arid conditions with dry feet. Another theory argues that red hot coals are poor conductors of heat, and during a brisk firewalk there isn't enough time for the heat to be transferred to the feet. This was proven by placing a raw steak on hot coals where it wasn't immediately seared. But firewalkers soon disproved the theory by walking on a hot steel skillet, a surface that did sear the steak. I have my own theory, and it's never been put in print yet, so I'm sharing it with the world for the first time today. In my science class, the teacher took a paper cup, and he placed the paper cup on a flame, and he boiled the water in the paper cup. And to an eighth grader, this seemed like magic, but it's not magic at all. The reason that the water boils and that the cup doesn't burn is because the kindling point for the paper is higher than 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Now when that water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, the water does not get any hotter. After it's in the flame for a longer period of time, it turns into vapor, but the water itself stays at 212 degrees. So the water in contact with that paper prevents the paper from getting any hotter than 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So of course the paper is not going to burn because it has to go beyond 212 degrees to kindle, to burst into flame. When we put our foot into the coal bed, the blood going through our bodies is very similar to the water in the paper cup. That as long as we are emotionally prepared so that we are not interfering with the flow of this blood through the tissue, the blood cools the tissue down. It's not that our foot cools down the embers. If you raise the temperature of your tissues to a certain point, you're going to burn. So obviously the people who don't burn are people who are not raising their flesh to a high enough temperature that they're going to injure themselves. And the variable seems to be your state of mind because flesh is the same, the, the coals, they're the same, and yet in a group of a hundred people, if there's two or three that are burned, how do you explain that just using physical things like the Leidenfrost uh, idea or the conductivity theory? The variable, it would seem, would be the person's state of mind, not the physical setup. Like every new technology, the discovery of electricity in the 19th century was immediately exploited by magicians eager to baffle their audiences with this new science. The flickering neon of Las Vegas is a modern reminder of the first magician to see his name up in lights. Henri Robin was a serious rival of Robert Houdin and opened his own theater in Paris in 1862, a theater devoted to science, magic, and electricity. On a stage crowded with the latest electrical devices, such as Rumkoff coils and Geissler tubes, he played to audiences eager to witness the wonders of the electrical age. A look at some of the few remaining Geissler tubes still in existence, filled with their rare gases and photon-driven wheels, makes it easy to understand why those audiences were captivated.
One of the strangest magicians to exploit the wonders of electricity was the self-styled Dr. Walford Bodie. A master of self-promotion, he advertised himself as the living miracle. Claiming unsurpassed knowledge of all things electrical, Bodie shocked British audiences during the early part of the 20th century. His notoriety, for so it became, stemmed from his electrical equipment and the quack cures that he claimed to produce on stage. He would invite up the halt and the lame and it appeared to the audience that by subjecting them to his hypnotic effects, which he called the Bodhi force, or the Bodic force, uh, they were cured. My lords, my ladies and gentlemen, Wilton's, the handsomest room in town, is proud to present for your edification tonight the pride of the North, the electric wizard, the modern miracle worker, the famous bloodless surgeon, the one, the only, Walford Bodie, MD! Bodhi's electrical act included his infamous electric chair, where he'd pass thousands of volts of electricity through a member of the public. Audiences were horrified, but what they didn't know was that static electricity, though capable of inflicting a nasty shock, is not life-threatening. Bodhi knew that as long as the amperage is small, the human body can withstand very high voltages. Armed with this secret knowledge, Bodhi was able to produce sparks, light bulbs, and ignite torches by human touch alone. There are a number of tricks and illusions in magic that were very popular and mysterious in the 19th century and early 20th century that have been made obsolete and anachronistic and rather ineffective or ineffective by breakthroughs in well-known scientific technology. Bodhi's career was virtually finished by the rising popularity of the motion picture and the subsequent demise of the music halls. Motion pictures relied on their own kind of magic, the ability of the human eye and brain to make a series of fast-moving still images seem that they were in continuous motion. And naturally, it was a magician, Georges Méliès, who pioneered its popularity. Many of the films he made are simply a reworking of some of the live magic performances that were popularized in the 19th century by magicians like Robert Houdin. Instead of using classic magical methods, Méliès developed techniques of photography, which, to the uninitiated audience, achieved the same magical effect. What makes Méliès' magic more astounding is that all of that trick photography was done in the camera, without the benefit of modern computer animation or digital technology. His technique became known as stop-motion photography and ultimately went on to form the basis of modern film animation. Méliès' technique relied on a fixed position camera, which was stopped at the point that Méliès wanted the effect to occur. The performer then froze into position and assistants brought on additional props and replaced playing cards. When everything was in place, the camera would be restarted. When the finished film was projected, the effect would appear to be completely seamless, a one-shot magic trick. At the end of the 20th century, as film and television mature, magicians are faced with a bewildering choice of technology with which to confound their audiences. It may not be long before virtual reality magic, where the audience becomes the magician, is commonplace. In our cynical and over-informed age, there's a growing youth culture that suspects that all magic, on stage or television, is created with movie-style special effects. For the time being, though, magicians still mystify and amaze modern audiences with time-honored tricks. 
Maybe movies are just the latest smoke and mirrors, forever making the impossible seem possible. The magic touch. The magic touch. You like this TLC show? Now you can own it. Call 1-800-636-8324 and start an adventure for your mind. TLC offers its best shows on home video, including the episode you just saw. All the action, the insight, the practical advice you count on from TLC. Get your own high-quality VHS tape of this show for only $19.95. TLC, adventures for your mind on home video. Call 1-800-636-8324. Next 